Okay, I think I've calmed enough down from my last video to, to do a normal one. Uh, the last video, which would have been the one that you saw yesterday about NaNoWriMo, if, if you are a regular follower of this channel. So I did want to do a wrap-up for Star Trek. I've been reading uh, a lot of stuff. I don't know how I'm going to do. On, I picked out some stuff I might want to do for events in... September, probably going to go lighter on the events, although it's probably already changed already. I should do a TBR because people like those, seem to like, people like to, seem to watch, people seem more curious about what you are planning to read and what you're planning to do than what you have done on YouTube, as far as I can tell, just from my numbers. Uh, what people like is TBRs and DNFs, uh, but... Like my friend Faceless Book Reviews said in a video a few, uh, maybe a week ago or so, a link if I can remember to, he doesn't like to do, he's kind of stopped doing TBRs even though they, they do well because he wants to just go with the flow of, of his reading and I'm feeling the same way. So I'm just going to talk about what I've, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not ready to let go of Summer of Trek yet. So I've read a little more Trek, and uh, I want to particularly talk about one book, The Side Mission, in a minute, But uh, because I think it sums up some things nicely. But the first actual Trek novel I read since my last update was this epic crossover tale, Star Trek The Original Series, No Time Like the Past by Greg Cox, featuring James T. Kirk and Seven of Nine. It starts out in... Um, Kirk's on a mission with uh, Spock and McCoy and in, in true form of the original series it's Kirk, Spock, McCoy and everybody else is an extra which is fine. Those are the characters I like from the original series. And they go into, down to a planet with a particularly like a, a, almost a stock character not in a bad way but like a, a traditional Star Trek villain of a recalcitrant and arrogant uh, diplomat who wants to run everything his way and not listen to the, the pros, the military pros, like the captain of the Enterprise about how to run. Anyway, they run into some problems. Skips ahead to, skips far ahead to Voyager in the Delta Quadrant. And uh, those are some of my, my, my favorite chapters. I really think Greg Cox did better uh, writing. There's one chapter that re really focused on Voyager before uh, 7 of 9. She's from Voyager, if you don't know. She's uh, part Borg. Uh, re, uh, a, um, what do you say, a rescued, a renovated? I don't know what you would say. She was, she was captured by the Borg as a child, raised as a Borg, uh, one of the main themes of the second half of Voyager, when it gets really good, seasons four, five, six, and seven, was was her rehumanization, Jane Janeway's uh, attempt to rehumanize uh, Seven. Anyway, she gets thrown into the past, uh, and she has to deal with the crew, and you know, and um, not reveal anything about the future, that kind of stuff. So I, I thought it was a very good book. I really. As I, I said, I think Greg Cox, I think I might have read something else by him at one point. Anyway, I'm familiar with him a little bit. Seemed like he had a better handle on the characterizations of the Voyager crew than the original Trek crew, which I thought was interesting because I have to tell you, I, I've read some other more recent books. I re of all the Star Trek books I've read, I think the weakest ones are about the original series. I think the others, the later ones are stronger in general. I have some theories on that, but maybe I'll talk about it later. Uh, maybe it's just that the, the original crew is just so iconic and stoic and... and and more, more distant in time, especially these early ones... Uh, Compared to, when was this written? Probably, this is probably like written, uh, I should look it up. Probably not that long ago, but definitely after the, the 
uh, Voyager ended as a series. Anyway, I like crossovers. Uh, right now I'm reading, I really am like a Voyager kid now. I, I do like Voyager a lot. You know, I think it's one I go back to a lot. It was never my favorite until this, this rewatch earlier this year when I watched every damn Star Trek. Uh, it held a lot of appeal for me. What I'm reading right now is Star Trek Voyager full circle. I'm only about four or five chapters into it. can't really see it there. Uh, it's by Kristen Beyer, and this is extremely well written for a Star Trek book. And again... My apologies to fans of the original series and the original classic Trek books by people like Diane Duane and people like that. I just don't think they're as well written as the ones. You know, there's thousands of Star Trek books, so could be I've just had bad luck with them. But th this book, this book is as well written, and this this one takes place after Voyager has returned home, uh, which is which is a great era in in Star Trek. You know, an un, it's another lost era. You know, of course, the, the main lost eras are between the end of the first series and the start of the movies, and then between the end of the, the last Star Trek original series movie and the start of Next Generation. But I, and then there's this, this era at, from the end of Voyager all the way up till Picard starts, I guess, when we really don't know that much about what goes on, except in the books, you know, which are not canon and can contradict each other and all that. But finishing watching the Star Trek Voyager series, which I never watched, I mean, I caught an episode here and there when it was on originally, but finishing the series a few months ago, six months ago probably now, I really, really wanted to know about that reintegration period once they return and I had issues with the with the finale I don't think it was a good finale I think I had some, I have some ethical issues with some of the things that were done in the finale which would just if I go into it will turn this into a Star Trek rant channel which maybe I should probably do as a different channel um, anyway uh, but Kristen Beyer excellent writer is in my opinion so I'm going to see what else she's done but what I wanted to talk about was the uh, the Wrath of the Summer of Khan side missions. One was to read a book of science, which I didn't end up doing. I had one I wanted to read, but didn't get around to it. So maybe next year, or maybe I'll just read it for it's a book I've wanted to read for um, other purposes anyway for a while. So maybe it'll turn up somewhere else. But um, since I was finally freed from my horrible self-imposed bondage of the 100 book challenge, I was able to buy books. And I bought a book for 75 cents, which I'll discuss at a different time because it's not Star Trek related. That was my first book back. Then I went and uh, there's a book I've been waiting for, uh, which I know is, is in pre-pub right now, which I wanted to see if it was available by Nicholas Meyer. He is, among other things, he is one of the best. Well, I'm going to say he's the best Sherlock Holmes pastiche writer. Just because I, I really think all his books are good. Uh, his first one was, and there's a gap there somewhere. He's written probably five or six now. Uh, his first one was, the seven percent solution, which is probably the worst one, the less good one. Um, it's about Fre Sherlock Holmes meets uh, Sigmund Freud. Uh, it's about a hundred pages before uh, Nicholas Meyer decides she probably have like some sort of mystery involved too. Uh, so it's not the most balanced book. I think they they fixed they cleaned it up a little bit in the movie version. Then his second, uh, it was big success. Uh, he once he finally got the rights to the uh, once they finally got the rights cleared. Uh, very interesting how this book came apart, and this will I'll explain how I know this later. But how this book came together, I mean, he was a screenwriter, aspiring screenwriter. He had a few works gone. Then there was a writer strike, seventy eight or something like that. 74 
he decided to write a novel. He decided to write a Sherlock Holmes novel. This is the naive, naivete of youth. You know, he had some connections by this time. Uh, so he writes this Sherlock Holmes novel, which you can't do. That's a pastiche. You cannot do that. At that time, it was all under copyright. However, he had enough connections with publishers, and these publishers, uh, one publisher loved it, then he got a lawyer, and the lawyer goes, you're crazy to, to take this offer, take it to this other, anyway, ends up getting this, this big deal, this big publishing deal for it, doesn't have the rights. Publisher, this is how, how much they won this book, they're like, don't worry, we'll work it out with the Doyle estate. That goes on for quite a while. Then he has to uh, pull it and take it to another publisher who does finally get permission from the from the estate to publish it. So they knew they had uh, something that was going to pay off for them to go through all this hassle with the Doyle estate. Anyway, they they def they wanted a sequel. He did one called The West End Horror. Uh, Seven Percent Solution is by by far the most famous one. The West End Horror, I think, I like better. Uh, Nicholas Meyer is a very erudite person. He's very educated. He puts a lot of research into his books and into his screenplays. The West End Horrors, the West End uh, Theater District, like the Broadway of London, and it involves all the characters uh, in the theater scene at that time. So Bram Stoker's a character. It was interesting. I happened to read it right around the time that I read the Bram Stoker biography that came out a few years ago. It talks about Bram Stoker and his relation to to the literary scene and Oscar Wilde and Oscar Wilde's mother and fascinating book. I'll put that in the notes too. I don't remember the name of it, but it's a great book. And Bram Stoker, now known as the novelist of Dracula, but you know his working life, he was a, a person of the theater, a producer, and and uh, that kind of thing. <clears throat> so, then his third book, then Nicholas Meyer's third book, and these are all allegedly, like, you know, they're all written as, like, lost manuscripts of John Watson. That Nicholas Meyer shows up in the in the prologue and says, you know, somebody, you know, he finds a, a previously undiscovered John Watson M.D. manuscript in his aunt's house or something like that. And as it goes on, people just, are finding their own manuscripts and sending them to him and he's allegedly editing them you know which is a nice cover for making the mistakes as an American and and you can say uh, this is like the editing or whatever uh, so it's, you know it's a fun con con conceit as done in many of the the Watson many of the past the Holmes pastiche novels that different writers do and they're not very long uh, the third one's called the Canary Trainer and that's probably my favorite of the first three. Uh, and it's the hardest one to find. It might not even been published by the same press. It might have been just... Anyway, it's it's from the time... It's from... Oh, it's set in Holmes's lost years. The, 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 the period after Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes that ends with the final problem where, where Holmes is thought to be dead with Moriarty disappears so this is a story that takes place in that time he goes Holmes in this book goes to Paris and uses his, his skills as a violin player uh, to get in the orchestra of the Paris Opera House where he meets where he's reacquainted with Irene Adler who, of course, is a singer from Scandal in Bohemia, and he meets the Phantom, and all kinds of terrific stuff in that book. And it's Meyer is a, a massive, massive opera fan, and a great book. Then I think the next one, then there's a big gap. Uh, at least two more. The most recent one's about Egypt. I didn't like that one as much. I can't remember the name right now, but the, the one after that was... Uh, I might be skipping one, but there was Sherlock Holmes and the Adventure of the Peculiar Protocols, 
which is about the protocols of the elders of, elders of Zion. Uh, Meyer's Jewish, so he wanted to write a book that involves this, this famous forgery, uh, this alleged, this anti-Semitic forgery written in Russia meant to sl slander the Jews, called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and also uh, takes advantage of the fact, either that or he makes it up, that, that, that Watson's wife's maiden name is Garnett, I think. Or at least he pretends it is. Anyway, in this book, Watson's wife at the time happens to be the sister or sister-in-law, I can't remember, of Constance Garnett, the the translator of uh, War and Peace and other books. So Constance Garnett is a character in the book. And it's very nice. So he, he ties in like the publishing industry and stuff like that. I didn't mean to talk about all those Sherlock Holmes books, but I, I really do recommend Nicholas Meyer's Sherlock Holmes books. But he the reason I brought him up at all was he was the, the side mission I picked was I was looking for that new one that's that's just about to come out, which is not out yet. And then I was reminded of this other book he wrote, which was only six bucks. And since I'm able to buy books now, I thought, what the hell? fits right in even though the even though the summer is over I am belatedly doing the side mission for the Wrath of the Summer of Trek the Autumn of the Wrath of the Summer of Trek I did The View from the Bridge by Nicholas Meyer uh, Memories of Star Trek and a Life in Hollywood Director of Star Trek 2 and 6 so Nicholas Meyer um, other than writing those Sherlock Holmes pastiches is most famous for writing for his involvement in Star Trek. So this this book goes through his early days trying to get into Hollywood. He does a couple things early on in the book that are very annoying. Uh, but he, he, he makes up for it. The first was saying, starts out saying, you know, I'm not a Nepo baby. I didn't know anybody in Hollywood. And I know a lot. there's a lot of Nepo babies out there, but I'm not one of them. And I just, I got through and... You know, but he comes from an upper middle class background. His father's a psychiatrist. His mother was in the Philharmonic Orchestra. He's he's not hard scrabble. He's upper middle class. <laughs> you know, his, his his sister's dating a movie producer. Uh, it's you know he he had he had options and he had uh, privilege. Which is fine, you know, he still had to do the work, and he's an extremely talented writer. He's an extremely talented storyteller. So he was trying to make his way in Hollywood. He really took advantage of his different opportunities. You know, he got a job after he, after he was in school. He went to school in Iowa. He wasn't in the writer's wor workshop, but he knew people in the writer's workshop, and he was in, and he... He was the movie reviewer for four years at the college newspaper and that kind of stuff. He translated that into a publicity job in New York. He has some very funny stories about the publicity, working publicity in New York in the 70s. And I was just really writing, rewriting horrible Hollywoodese prose into like prose that re was readable enough to send to the New York papers and of course, it was long, long before the internet. And talks about how one part of his job was to go out. You know, one day him and all the assistants had to go out and each buy ten copies each of of The Godfather uh, because the studio wanted to make sure the book was a bestseller before the movie came out. And that was the kind of thing that went on. And he very slyly says, of course, that would never happen today. So, so there's some cool insider stuff that he worms his way onto the set of Love Story because... He, and that's another book that was manufactured uh, by, uh, into a bestseller by Hollywood. Eric Siegel was a screenwriter. He worked on Yellow Submarine. Uh, he was a screenwriter who got this, you know, they, they wanted to make this book. They wanted to do a romantic book. And, and at the time, the way to make a big movie was to have, was have it based on a bestselling novel. And so they manufactured Love Story as a best selling novel. Anyway, he gets he gets to work on the set. You know, he gets to hang out on the set. Um, 
just really observing, learning how how to how movies are made and that kind of thing. And he ends up writing a, a book about it called the Love the Love Story Story, which is like a memoir about Hollywood. So he's always working angles and stuff. And he goes to Hollywood. Finally, moves from uh, New York to Hollywood because he knows he's got to do that. Writing quite a lot of a lot during this time. Unpublished novels, unpublished scripts. He has kind of a high. Uh, you know, he's like this isn't necessarily the same timeline, but he's 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 trying to always he, like he, for years he's trying to write, he's trying to to get his version of the Fifth Business by Robertson Davies made as a film, which if you know that book, you can see what a what a you know it's it's fantastic book, it's a wonderful trilogy, uh, the Robertson Davies Davies books, Fifth Business, Manticore, and uh, and whatever the other one's called. Uh, some my, some of my favorite books that that trilogy by Robert, Robertson Davies, the the great Canadian writer. Um, but you can see where <laughs> Hollywood might not be that happy, you know. And later on, he's trying to make Don Quixote and stuff. In between that, he's doing more commercial work. So he gets this. He is stays friends with with a buddy from the. the um, Iowa workshop this friend of his is writing a book with what he thinks is a great concept what Myers thinks is a great concept and this friend got the idea from seeing Myers success writing the 7% solution the uh, Freud and, and Sherlock Holmes book gets his own cool idea which is even a better idea um and when this movie came out, when I was in high school, I still remember the radio spots for it. It was seemed like the most awesome thing, and it was. It's a great movie. Uh, time after time, Nicholas Myers loves the idea for it. He's written some screenplays by now. He's written some TV movies and stuff. So he buys the film rights from his friend, and he writes a screenplay on this unpublished novel, which was later published. It was only like 65 pages are done at this time. And at this, and he starts to learn, he's like, yeah, I'm a good writer, but I'm really much better at adapting. And I remember the radio uh, ad, like I said at the time, it was, it was, it was a Malcolm McDowell movie, and the radio spot was like, <clears throat> you know, San Francisco, 1975. My name is H.G. Wells. I've come here in a time machine of my own construction. I'm pursuing Jack the Ripper. And that's the movie. A.C. <laughs> Wells. If you've never seen Time After Time, you got to see it. A.C. Wells is having a dinner party, you know, and he's a famous writer, and it's Malcolm McDowell's playing him, which was a really uh, risky casting at the time. Uh, uh, because it, it, Malcolm and I only played villains, and he was cast in this movie as H.G. Wells, the hero. David Warner plays his friend. They're having their big dinner party. He's saying, oh, yeah, I've got my new time machine I just invented. And uh, uh, he's like, that's pretty cool. We'll look at it after dinner. And one of his friends uh, turns out to be, and it's revealed at the dinner, one of his friends is actually Jack the Ripper, who jumps in the time machine, escapes first. Time machine comes back empty. H.G. Wells knows he's got to go to the future and uh, capture or kill Jack the Ripper, who's played by David Warner. I think I said that. Fantastic. Fantastic. So H.G. Wells goes to the 70s, San Francisco. And if you know this later Star Trek movies, you know that will come back anyway. So Nicholas Meyer wrote that script. He parlayed his he had written the novel 7% Solution and he also wrote the script which made him a hot ticket and then the, the screenplay was so good that he held out he stuck to his guns he held out for directing the directing job 7% time after time directs the movie big hit spends the ne next 3 or 4 years trying to make the Robertson Davies movie and finally they're they're just like you have to 
work. You can't, you know, you're, he's got down, too far down the road of being an artist and like, you know, I'm only going to do what I want to do. And, and, you know, people are telling him, you have to make some money. People are forgetting about you. Which is how he ended up in the Star Trek universe. He got hired uh, to work on Star Trek and and the second Star Trek movie, you know, and the first one, if people remember, was not that good. I mean, I was a Star Trek nerd when I was a kid, and when that first movie came out, I was very excited. And after that movie came out, Star Trek the motion picture, I thought, well, that's that's that. Didn't really work out. And that, that by the time Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan came out, I was like, why would I, why would I see that? Why would anyone see that? that those, those movies are terrible. That movie was terrible. Why would I see a sequel to it? But then my dad, actually, at the time, I just I was visiting him, and he was like, no, that movie's really good, actually. So me and my dad went to see something else, and it, it was still playing at the at the same multiplex. So I thought, well, I'll just I'll just stay over and see it after. And of course, it's a fantastic movie, uh, Wrath of Khan. So he talks about so Nicholas Meyer talks about that. And this is the point in the book where he gets to he does the second annoying thing that I will forgive him for later, uh, which is. He's got to let you know. They've all got to J.J. Abrams do the same thing, and some of the actors do the same thing, too, when they when they do this kind of... Uh, when they go on these franchises, you know. Harrison Ford is, is the... is the big one these days. Harrison Ford's always got to let you know how he thinks he's this stuff is all crap, and it's all beneath him. And Nicholas Meyer's the same way. He's like, ah, oh, that's... A, Got the pointy ears. I don't, you know, as I, he's, you know, very bragging about how he doesn't value it, never watched it, never would watch it. But he takes the job, uh, and it's a very interesting process. I know I've gone on way too long about his career. Um, but his entire thought process of how he works through. And how he ended up writing the greatest Star Trek movie. I mean, writing, well, really writing the two greatest Star Trek movies and directing the greatest Star Trek movie. You know, he does this. After he does this, he's not involved in Star Trek III because he's doing another project. Star Trek IV comes around. They ask him to come in and help with the script. He writes, Star Trek IV is one of the whales. He writes the middle section you know, he, they work out, they've got a terrible script, they've got the basic idea, but he writes all the San Francisco stuff. And first he wanted to change it to Paris. He's like, I already did a time travel movie about San Francisco, time after time. I don't want to just repeat that. They're like, hey, Starfleet base is in San Francisco. It's got to be San Francisco. So he he writes all that stuff. So he's really good. And those, that's the really heart of that movie is all the, the stuff in the past. Then later he comes back for Star Trek VI. Um, but what I wanted to read was, and I thought about this, you know, you know, bear in mind what I said about his initial thinking is just kid stuff and it's stupid, it's the guy with the pointy ears and stuff. But I was thinking of it in terms of um, in terms of Garbogus. So I'm going to read a couple paragraphs here from his epilogue. You know, this is the guy, this is a, Nicholas Meyer, very cultured guy. All his Sherlock Holmes books, Sherlock Holmes is probably like, in his whole canon of stuff that he's interested in, it's probably like the most popular. Everything else is very esoteric and... You know, he worked on a, uh, tried to do a, a version of the Iliad for years, or maybe it was the Odyssey, I don't remember. You know, and his Don Quixote, and these his passion projects are all these big uh, epic that didn't get made, were all these big epic um, classics and that kind of thing. Or historical uh, stories, some were made. He, d he did The Day After on television, which is a pretty brilliant movie. It was big, had an impact at the time very big impact it was the anti-nuclear war movie very realistically done he had a lot of problems with the uh, the network on that um, 
So in his epilogue, he starts talking about all this. I always dreamed of writing and directing movies, and I've been lucky enough to realize that dream. Nonetheless, I remain a transplanted Easterner, still a stranger to the world of Hollywood and filmmaking. I used to be amazed at parties at the response I got when I said I loved such and such a film. What do you mean you loved it? It didn't do a dime. If I've heard this logic once, I've heard it a million times. In the converse, you hated it. It did 200 million. How could you hate it? How can I complain or cavil with this standard of measurement? It is called show business. Am I maintaining that films are art? And if I am, how can they not also be business any less than Shakespeare's Globe Theater was a money-making operation? If a play did not please, it didn't make money. And if it didn't make money, you can bet it wasn't revived. Well, not until years later. The world of art is full of posthumous success stories. For every Mozart buried anonymously in a pauper's grave, Hollywood can point to films that flopped. It's a Wonderful Life, Citizen Kane, Bringing a Baby, but are today revered as classics of the medium. <clears throat> then this is the part I wanted to get to. Such ruminations are part of my attempt to figure out just what I feel about the Star Trek series, which I once dismissed as one about the man with pointy ears. While its scientific trappings and much of its premises may be absurd, it is, it is that absurdity and greater than... Uh, let me start again. While its scientific trappings and much of its premise may be absurd, is that absurdity any greater than, say, the Greek myths with their half-man, half-bull, monsters, flying horses, and all-too-human gods? Are Spock's ears any more improbable than wings on the ankles of Hermes? For that matter, is the content of Star Trek any more improbable than Moses parting the Red Sea or Christ rising from the dead? Are Homer's bickering gods and goddesses more plausible than Mickey and Minnie? Are the only valid legends old legends? Do the Star Trek tales perform no useful purpose other than as a re reassuring gloss on an America first gunboat diplomacy view of America's place in the world universe? Late terms of getting allergies. <clears throat> All right, I know the answers to none. I know the answers to none of these questions, and certainly having contributed to some of these legends, I am too close to be in any way objective regarding their value. But I suspect that in the long run, it is the long run itself that counts. Star Trek's importance or lack of the same will not be determined by how much money the films have made. It will not be determined by critical appraisals in varying venues. No, no, time is the ultimate arbiter of art. Time is the ultimate arbiter of art. When Nixon visited China, he banqueted with the wily quarter courtier, Zhu Enlai, Zhao Enlai, and asked him during the meal what he thought of the French Revolution. It's too early to tell, was Zhao's answer. So I think it is with all manner. So I think it is with all manner of art. There's a kind of aesthetic Darwinism at work in art. The fittest survive, but oftentimes, works initially celebrated pass quickly into oblivion, while those dismissed at the time stubbornly defy internment. There seems to be no logic or formula by which survival or extinction can be predicted. Sometimes art intended as highbrow what Hollywood refers to as prestige pictures made to win awards disappear without a trace while programmers, also known as B-pictures, turn out to be the real thing. It is certainly not without meaning that George Lucas' Star Wars films as well as his Indiana Jones series were made as homages to Saturday morning serials, quickie productions that didn't count. Films on which Hollywood lavished extraordinary care and ambition such as Daryl Zanuck, Wilson, don't seem to wear as well. Is Ben-Hur a film worth watching aside from his justly celebrated chariot race? I'm only asking. Were the folks turning out what we celebrate today as film noir really believing that what they were doing was art? Was the curse of the cat people supposed to be art? And yet it is often these films relegated to the bottom half of the double bill that seems to endure. One could go further, one could go a step further and wonder whether movies themselves were ever thought of by their creators as art 
or was art conferred upon them and their makers with the passage of time? I think that's as far as I wanted to go. And so with Star Trek, I cannot gauge its value or understand its meaning except subjectively. While the films are not ones I would have deliberately chosen as a vehicle for self-expression, I did begin this book by acknowledging the happenstance paths of life and their unlooked-for consequences. I cannot die, cannot deny that there that my life has been changed and enriched as a result of my association with the series, and perhaps the lives of others have been affected as well. Who's to say? If I had got to make my film versions of Robertson Davies' novel Fifth Business, that as many people would have been affected by the result. How many scientists and astronauts at NASA were first inspired by the silliness that was Star Trek to reach for the stars? Answer, a lot. Okay, so I, you know, by the end of the book, I, I could go on there, but I think that makes his point. Um... You know, I had to forgive him for his snobbishness about Star Trek because he came around in the end, uh, which he had to, which you know he has to. No matter what these people you can say, you cannot do as good of movies as Star Trek, Wrath of Khan, and Star Trek The Voyage Home without some affinity for the material. And I thought it was a, a good way to sum up, if anybody's still listening, Good way to sum up Garb August as well. You know, we celebrate these old books that at the time were just dismissed as trash and sometimes still are dismissed as trash genre books. And sometimes they survive because people put their, they put something genuine into them. They put something of themselves into them. And those are the ones that we remember. And uh, back to yesterday's video, I don't think AI can do that. I'll end it there and we'll talk again.